spoof that's been on for years where it's the one where the little boy says, uh, or his parents tell him, you're going to shoot your eye out. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that one. He gets a BB gun for Christmas. And, and anyway, his father is a turkey junkie. And uh, he lives to eat turkey. And that's a Christmas, but I like turkey all time. And yesterday we had a smoked turkey and a roasted turkey and a little bit of ham too. So it was a blessed day, a wonderful day. And yes, Krista, I am taking things out of my normal routine. Typically on a holiday, I don't address the holiday. I speak on something else. But uh, this year, just for a change up, I, I thought I would put together some uh, of my own thinking on, on the holiday of Thanksgiving. It's a blessed time. It's a wonderful time. It's a family time. And so we're going to consider that for a while this morning. Uh, to, I don't know where Michaela went. She disappeared. But uh, I wanted to tell her. And you all can tell her, maybe she can hear me, I don't know. Uh, it was so good to hear that baby cry this morning in meeting. Amen. That's the first time we've had a baby cry here for quite a few months. Mm -hmm. And so it's always good to hear the, the newborn uh, crying. And, and I want little Isabella to know that she has my permission. If she comes <laughs> back in, she can cry my whole sermon through. <laughs> this won't bother me one bit. So uh, we're glad to welcome her here this morning. What could be said new and different about Thanksgiving? I mean, as old as a lot of us are, and I'm looking at Arnold, not truly, but Arnold, uh, what could be said new? What could be said different? What could be said in addition to what we already read in Scripture, maybe, and have thought about for years and years concerning Thanksgiving? Well, perhaps not much, but the first verse that I put on our sheet, the little verse sheet, is 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, which says, If thou shalt put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And so I'm, I... By that verse, I'm kind of trying to pat myself on the back because it says, you're a good minister of Jesus Christ if you bring things to remembrance. And so if there's nothing new that is learned, at least chalk it up to things that we have talked about before and things that we should be cognizant again of even today. So we're going to talk a little bit about Thankfulness and what does it mean? First of all, I'd like to start with a series of did you know? You know, always a series of did you know this? And uh, at my house, like I said, one of the favorite games, my wife's favorite game is, is a game called That. T-H-A-T, -T, That. And we're sitting there, you know, grandma and grandpa, great grandma and great grandpa, and, and uh, she'll say, did you hear that? Of course, I'm mostly deaf, so no. <laughs> and then a little while, did, did you see that? I didn't see that. <laughs> Do you smell that? Well, I don't smell that. And so we play that. Well, today we're going to play this little thing, Did You Know, just for a little while here. Did you know when the first time the word thanks and thanksgiving appears in the Bible. Turn to Leviticus chapter 7. And Brother Danny kind of got into this in the, at the Lord's Supper, and I'm, I'm so glad that he touched base on this, because when you come to Leviticus chapter 7, this is where you get the first time in our English Bible that it talks about thanksgiving. And it talks about thanksgiving in relation to the peace offering. Now you would think that this is an awful late occurrence in scripture for the word thanksgiving to be uh, introduced. I mean, certainly Adam and Eve were thankful. Noah had to be thankful. I mean, to step out of that boat on dry ground, I would be thankful. I know he had to be thankful and 
Job, who was, uh, lived among the patriarchs, had to be thankful. But it's interesting that there is no mention in our Bible to get to Leviticus chapter 7. And then it talks about thanksgiving. Leviticus 7 verse 11. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall bring unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with a sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil and anointed and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, uh, mingled with oil, the first one, and anointed the second one, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. Beside the cakes he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with a sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. This is the first mention of thanksgiving. Now, the peace offering was enumerated in Leviticus chapter 3. And verse 5 is the verse you were looking for this morning, uh, which talks about the fact that this peace offering is one of the three sweet savor offerings. But when you get to Leviticus 7, Leviticus 7 makes an amendment, if you will, on several of the offerings. And so when we go to Leviticus chapter 3, and it talks about the peace offering, it is talking about peace with God. And that required what? A blood sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But when you get to Leviticus chapter 7, it makes an amendment. If you already have peace with God, it says you can take in addition to the animal that you bring that sheds blood, you bring with it these leavened and unleavened cakes. Why unleavened, you would say? Because when we have peace with God, we then are eligible for the peace of God. You cannot have the peace of God without first having peace with God. And that's Leviticus chapter 3. But if you know God, if you made a sacrifice of, in the Old Testament of peace with God, then there came a time in your life when you were thankful for the peace that you had with God and you enjoy the peace of God, the peace which God's redemption can bring. And so this was a voluntary offering that a person could amend the peace offering with these cakes, leaven and unleaven. And why again unleaven? Because we still have sin in us. We don't have sin on us. When Christ died on the cross, he removed all of our sin and its penalty. But as we live in this life, not yet delivered from the power totally, except through the Spirit, in the presence of sin, we still contaminate ourselves. We still have peace, pardon me, sin in us. And therefore, when we come to the Lord's table, what do we do? We examine ourselves to see what's going on. And it says in 1 John chapter 1, remember, if we sin, what? We're to ask, what? We're supposed to confess our sins, remembering that his blood cleanses us mm -hmm. from all unrighteousness. When the, when the Lord washed the disciples' feet, remember, what was he doing? He wasn't giving them a bath, but he was cleaning the defilement from contact with this world. And so we have the unleavened wafers introduced with the peace offering because our peace depends on a clear communication between us and the Lord. And so we have peace with God that comes from him through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. We enjoy the peace of God as we come into his presence and enjoy what he's done for us. And so we cannot enjoy the peace that emanates from God until we first have peace with God. The foundation of peace, you might say, is our salvation. There can be no peace without salvation. Amen. The foundation of our peace is based upon our salvation. True salvation brings peace, and that peace is the basis of our thanksgiving. Turn, if you will, to Luke's Gospel, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and look at a, at a passage right here. Very quickly, these are very familiar. Luke, chapter 7, and I want to look at uh, verse 48. Now, remember... Uh, 
someone had made a Pharisee and made a woman a, a feast, and the woman a woman came into the feast, and she was a sinner, and that kind of disrupted the, the Thanksgiving feast that this Pharisee was making here. And it says in verse 48, and he said unto her, this sinful woman, he says, thy sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees, and they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, not to them, he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Do you see that? What preceded peace? Salvation. Now turn, if you will, just to the next chapter, chapter 8, and let us look at uh, verse 46, I believe it is. Yes. Remember the woman that came up behind the Lord Jesus Christ and touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. And notice what it says in uh, verse uh, 46. It says, And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Wait for it. Wait for it. Go in peace. You see how those two are connected. And this is what was brought to us when thanksgiving offering was first mentioned in scripture, it's in connection with peace and we cannot really have true gratitude until we know sin's forgiven. And then we have a gracious heart. Now turn, if you will, to Luke, the same book, and let's go to uh, chapter 24 this time. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> I might find it, I might not. And let's start here at about 36. Luke 24, 36. And as he thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now these were his disciples. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled and why do these thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet. Why did he tell them to look at his hands and his feet? Peace. Without that sacrifice, there can be no peace. And so these were disciples. They knew salvation. But they weren't enjoying peace. They looked at Christ and said, well, who is that? Mm -hmm. And he says, here's salvation. Look at my hands, look at my feet. The imprints, if you will, and the scars and the wounds of salvation. So this morning, I pray that as we go about our lives, that we would ever proclaim the gospel of peace. You know, that's the most important thing in this world. Mm -hmm is proclaiming the gospel and people having peace. Um, without having this peace, many things can be frightening. And we heard a message on, on the fear of God, and Phil brought us a good message uh, Wednesday before last, and, and uh, last week he had a, a message about the rapture and the, the peace and comfort that those, those would bring to us about the Lord Jesus Christ coming again. And so that was the first mention of Thanksgiving way back in Leviticus chapter 7. Now, another thing. Did you know that you can have a wrong premise in your Thanksgiving? And I've printed on the sheet there Luke chapter 18 and uh, verses 11 through 13. And remember, this is where the Pharisee went and he began to pray. And it says... Uh, in about verse 12, the, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. Can you imagine? 
God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. But who went to the house justified? Well, the sinner did. The publican did. But here's a man who thanked God for the wrong thing and having no reason not understanding the salvation of God. He offered thanks to God. But his premise, his whole... Uh, Understanding of it was absolutely wrong. And so we can have a wrong basis and a wrong premise sometimes for our thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful of that. And then finally, turn, if you will, to Romans. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to read just a few verses there. And this illustrates, if you will, the foundation of peace. Romans chapter 1. And let's start with verse 21. Now, we've already had described this that everybody should understand that there is a God and should acknowledge him as God through creation. And then the apostle here gives us a seven step downward of the world in apostasy and coming away from that understanding and their previous knowledge that there was a creator God. And it says here, in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And the first thing that was evident about this was what? Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, unto birds, unto four-footed beasts, and creeping things, and so on and so forth. Think about that. Ingratitude is a sign of an apostatizing heart. That seems very harsh, doesn't it? I, I, if I was writing the Bible, and this is proof that man didn't write the Bible, I don't think I would have ever listed that as one of those very definitive castigating steps downward from knowing who God was as creator in gratitude. And so I trust this morning we have thankful hearts. Mm. On your sheet, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I, I hope we understand that unthankfulness in the sight of God is not a small thing. It is not a small thing. And though for those of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know and to understand, I want myself to realize that thankfulness is one of the most upfront things in our Christian experience. Now I want to consider what I would call three primary texts. And the first one is Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And on your sheet, it says, And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Do all things in the name of Christ with what? Christ has a, a, a companion there, and it's with thanksgiving. Do all things. Thanksgiving, you see, is an integral part of what we do as believers. Now, you know, you talk about a filter. I, I look at your faces, and some of you are wearing these, these, uh, these masks. And, and, and what's that supposed to do? That mask is supposed to filter out uh, COVID viruses or keep us from sneezing on someone and spreading a, a COVID germ, you know. And, and, of course, everybody knows by now that the pore size of the mask is not <laughs> wouldn't stop a COVID germ. It's kind of like trying to, trying to stop mosquitoes with chain link. But anyway... <laughs> We do that to, out of obedience to authority and, and those over us, and we have this mask. But you know, a filter is something. 
Did you ever consider that when you do something, you should first think about thankfulness to God? You talk about a filter. You know, maybe that would keep you from not breaking the speed limit. Well, let's see, I need to get to the store real, real quick. Walmart might be out of my favorite candy. And so I need to go, you know, 65 and a 40 speed limit. Well, can I, how can I be thankful to God? How can I be in the spirit and attitude of thanksgiving and then decide that it's okay for me just to break the law? I tell you, thanksgiving and being thankful is a tremendous filter on what we do and what we say. Mm. You think about the end part of that in our life. Mm. We're to do everything, do all in his name with thanksgiving. And then Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20, another big verse talking about thanksgiving. And it says, giving thanks for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice how his name is mentioned each time. Let me tell you something. The focus of our entire life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The focus of our meeting here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. His person. Is what should be up front in our mind. And I had more message on this, and so I don't want to get sidetracked this morning, but the focus of this little group of believers is not to make ourselves happy in every little circumstance. Mm -hmm. It is not us related so much as it is Christ centered. Mm -hmm. And I have no other object today than to somehow lead you to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the absolute bullseye, the target of our life and our understanding, and it determines where I go to church and where I fellowship. It determines what I, what I per, perceive as, as what's good and what's bad. It's to get myself out of the picture and to get the Lord Jesus Christ in focus. Giving thanks for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a hard one to do. Now you can go back and you can retranslate that preposition if you want to. I don't choose to. Giving thanks for all things. What does that mean? Do we have enough faith to do that? Well, remember Joseph. He was grabbed by his brothers and thrown in an empty well into a pit. And the first thing Joseph did was say, oh, thank you, God. Thank you for kicking me into this pit. And then along came these, you know, these uh, Egyptians and these slave traders and uh, the brethren said, well, let's don't kill him. Let's, let's sell him to these slave traders and so as, as Joseph was being dragged along behind the camels as a, as a new slave prospect, why Joseph is saying, oh God, I thank you so much. I was in the pit first and now I'm, now I'm going to become a slave. You think Joseph was doing that? I don't know. But later on, what happened? Joseph discovered in his own words, it says in Genesis chapter 50, he told his brethren when he finally revealed himself to them, he says, you intended this for my hurt and, and my degradation, but God intended it for your good. Can you be thankful for a bad circumstance? Oh, you say, yeah, I, I want to retranslate that verse. I don't, I don't, that's too harsh. Can you be thankful for a pandemic in the United States of America? Mm. No, that's terrible. That's just unheard of. God, you're so mean and you're so cruel. And you know what? I don't think that the digital gospel has ever been so active than it has been in the past several months when people couldn't go to a church building and hear the message. All of a sudden, many of the evangelical churches begin to broadcast their messages 
And people that have maybe never heard the gospel would say, you know, something is going on and I'm a little frightened, I'm a little concerned. Oh, maybe it's tied into prophecy. And I believe it is. And so they tune in and they hear the gospel. How can you call the pandemic bad if it causes someone to stop what they're doing and look to God instead of to themselves mm -hmm. for their salvation, for their safety, and for their happiness. Mm -hmm. I pray that God's purpose would be revealed in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I don't accuse God of doing anything wrong. He allowed it. And his purpose will be accomplished. And I will, whether I understand it or not, I will be thankful for him. Amen. You know, many times, and I've said this before, I know, I, I get older and begin to repeat myself. That's the, the privilege of an old guy. But you know, I used to think, when I get home to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why did you allow COVID to come here? That's, God, why did you allow this in my life? I had a brand new car and a wreck it. Why did you, why did, I don't understand that. Why did you do that? You know, I've come to the conclusion, Daddy, mm. When I get to heaven, God doesn't owe me one explanation. Amen. Come on. I'm just going to accept it. I'm going to take it from him, and I'm going to be thankful to him for all things. Mm -hmm. The next one, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Three verses. Colossians, do all with thanksgiving. In Ephesians 5, for all things be thankful and finally in every circumstance we're to be thankful unto God. Talking about our circumstances and notice what it says in that verse. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you acknowledge that? Do we acknowledge the sovereignty and the workings of God in what sometimes we would call providence and say this is God's will? But I don't like it. This is God's will. Are you going to shake your fist at God if it's, if it's God's will that we're in a certain circumstance and it may not be comfortable and it may not be ideal and it may not please us it may agitate us and aggravate us and may sometimes make us shake our fists at God and there's one thing to ask God, why did you do this? Or another thing to say, well, why did you just do it? I would like a revelation of it. And so it says that every circumstance we should give thanks to God for what is his will. Both the circumstance and the fact that we give thanks. You know, sometimes young people, and I look at uh, these Johnson boys here, and I can't see what their faces look like behind those masks. I, I've decided that when I wear a mask, I should pull one up over my eyebrows, <laughs> and I would look a lot better, you know. But it's hard to walk around with that over my eyes. But you know, young people like, you know, Addie and, and these Johnson boys and these these uh, girls, these young ladies over here and one young boy. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a young person there back there. Yes. And uh, I'm looking around. We're sparse. But you know, they say, I wonder what the will of God is for my life. Should I be a nurse? Should I be a doctor? Should I be a foreign missionary? Should I marry a millionaire? What's God's will? I wonder what God's will is. You know what? You can look at this verse and it'll give you one thing that you know for sure is God's will. You want to know what God's will is for you? To give thanks. That's what his will is for you. Do all things giving thanks. For all things giving thanks. And in every circumstance we are to give thanks. And finally, I would like to consider briefly Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. 
another very familiar verse, but it says, Hebrews 13, 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. You see, it says by him, through him. We no longer have ritual offer, uh, altars to go to. We come through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who is at the same time both the altar and the offerer of our salvation. It's a new and living way. It's not Leviticus chapter 3 or, or chapter 7 again where we have an animal slain and we bake cakes and so forth. No, we come by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that ushers us in. It is on the basis of his person and our relationship to him. By him, therefore, let us make an offering, it says. And notice next, it is a continual offering. This offering of thanksgiving is to be constant and consistent. Now, I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I seem to be repetitive my first thought. I don't know about you. Maybe you're not. Maybe if you slept crooked and your, your leg is asleep or your arm is asleep, maybe that's the first thought. You think if it's still attached to your body or what. The older you get, why everything changes when you get older. What is the first thought you have in the morning? You know what I want mine to be? The very first waking, cognizant expression that I want from my mind and in my heart is to thank God. Thank you. And I don't know what the day is going to bring. I know what yesterday brought. But I think that our life's breathing on this earth ought to be in thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. When could we not thank God for all that he's done? I mean, the, the, the atoms that make up on my body, he holds them together. How could we not be thankful? I, I'm going to try to walk down these steps and go to my seat here in a few minutes and at my age, sometimes my steps aren't too steady. You know what? I'm going to be thankful if I get down on the steps and sit on, on the bench. When can you not be thankful? And I just pray that when I wake up in the morning, the very first thing I do is an utterance of thanks to God. Amen. Continually. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, you know, praise without ceasing. That doesn't mean that we're just praying all the time. Now, there are several people, obviously, in this congregation that are real prayer warriors because their knees are wearing out. You know, they're not here, here and, and Jane's dead and so forth. So they're having knee replacements and so forth. So that speaks to some of us who haven't had our knees replaced yet. So we ought to be praying. All right. And so it needs to be a, an upfront thing. Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates, that is, announce yourself, make introduction into his presence. Our salutation ought to be what? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Is that difficult? Is that hard? Is that something we can't understand? Is that something that God has to prove to us? And has to take the word of God to convince us. We enter into his gates, into his courts, into his presence with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then notice it says, let us offer. The Greek word, Greek word there for offer, anaphero, literally means to carry or to bring or bear up. It means, uh, it, it's so to cause movement from a lower position to a higher position. In other words, when it says Christ offered up his body, it means to go from a lower position up to a cross. And it has spiritual significance too. But it means to go from, from that which is of ordinary height to that which is elevated. 
You know, you've seen these waiters and they come in and, the, and they've got a tray and they raise that tray up. Of course, they're keeping it out of the way, everybody. But they also want you to, to uh, see what's being brought, you know. And they take this tray up. I remember there used to be an ice cream parlor here in town and, and you could get one of these great big <laughs> 21 scoop sundaes, you know. And it was fun to take someone in there who had never been there and order one of these big 21 scoop sundaes. <laughs> And the, the waiter or waitress would come in and they would hold this thing up and everybody would be looking up there and say, oh my goodness, look at that huge bowl of ice cream. And it would come down and plop, set in front of someone. There was an elevation there. Notice where to offer up. It is that which is center most, I believe, in our thanking, in our communion with God, to enter into his courts with thanksgiving. It is an offering. It is something that is elevated. It is something that is that is special. And then there was, it's associated with the word sacrifice. The Greek word thusaia. And that simply means a sacrifice or a victim. We say, no, wait a minute. How can my thanksgiving, the words of my mouth, be a victim? Well, it's used here metaphorically. And it's used here to describe, first of all, a volitional offering of our words. It's not that someone comes along and grabs a hold of our, our arm and begins to twist, you know, and say, you will give thanks. You do this. And, you know, look at our families. You know, your great uncle Erasmus gives you $100 for your birthday. Think that'd be a good deal? Yeah, I do. And, and you grab that $100 bill, and you, you and your mother says, well, what do you say? <laughs> oh, thank you, great uncle Ebenezer, or Erasmus, whatever. Uh, you see, this, this offering of Thanksgiving is something that shouldn't be coerced. It's a voluntary offering. And not only that, when it comes to thinking about a victim, a, a victim connotates um, duress. When those lambs are brought to the, to the altar, why, <laughs> that's a little bit of a time of stress for a lamb, don't you think, that they're going to be made an offering? When do you think, what do you think, how do you think God looks at an offering made by us? When everything is happy and skipping up and down and the stock market is hitting its high and I just got a raise at my job and I want a brand new car and oh God, thank you so much. Hmm? When something happens and out of our poverty we offer God thanksgiving. Which do you think means most to him? There was a woman, remember, who came along and she, she dribbled in two little mites in the offering box. And God saw that. And he said she put more in than someone who had lots of money and, you know, made a big show of giving. Perhaps the most endearing word of thanks to God from us comes when we're having trouble. And out of our trials and out of our testing comes thanksgiving. Think about it. And then finally notice, it's the fruit of our lips. Fruit is carpels, and, and that means the fruit of trees and, and, you know, vines of the fields, wheat and so forth. Fruit as out of one's loins, the progeny or the posterity, children, that's fruit. It also can refer to the product, which is, which is a product of our work, our act, or our deed, as a result of a life circumstance. That's the fruit. Something happens, and it's good. And that good action, that good circumstance, that good thing, whatever we did, it produces fruit that's thanksgiving. And again, suppose the life circumstance isn't so amazing. Do we still take as that widow did and say, I don't have much. But here it is. Mm -hmm. And I offer it to you out of my poverty and out of my destitution and maybe out of my sorrow. 
I offer you thanks, God, for this and for this and for something else. And so we see that this fruit, it's the product of energy, it's the product of purpose. Fruit is cultivated. Fruit is produced. It's a result of what goes on. And this fruit, by definition, it's the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. How much fruit did we harvest this year in 2020 that we presented unto God in thanksgiving? What was our harvest? Think about it. As we close, I want to look at two verses John chapter 11 and uh, verse 41. And this remembers where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he says in verse 41, John 11, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his <laughs> eyes and said, Father... I thank thee that thou hast heard the Lord Jesus Christ being thankful. He says, Father, I, I thank thee that, that you have heard me. How does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jesus is God in the flesh. You, you think there was any question in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ as to whether or not God heard him? What's going on here? On what basis could, could Jesus Christ in gratitude say to God, I, I thank you that you heard me? Is it, is it like that God, God didn't necessarily always hear his son? Huh, funny thinking, you know. Puzzling when we think about it in terms of just human, human experience. Verse 42 says, and I knew that thou hearest me always. Oh, now it's a comfort to know that. And he's saying this out loud. <coughs> he's saying this out loud. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Let me ask you something. How important is giving thanks? How is it? How important is it? In the presence of strangers that you give thanks. In the, in the restaurant, I have absolutely no problem of bowing my head out loud and giving thanks. I have no problem standing in the line at Dillon's, buying a loaf of bread, and talking to the person behind me or in front of me in line there, hollering across six foot, uh, <laughs> I'm sure thankful that the Lord gave us such good weather today. Do you do that? The Lord Jesus Christ did. That was his example. Father, I thank you that you heard me. Why did he say that? So we could hear. And so we, by his example, could offer thanksgiving in the presence and in the hearing of others. Father, again, we are thankful for your goodness. We are thankful for salvation. And Father, how well we agree with thy words. Thankful unto God for his unspeakable gift. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, that refers to you, to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made a sacrifice for our sins, that we could have peace. And now we enjoy the peace of God. Father, let us be eternally grateful. Be with us this day. Dismiss us now with that blessing we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.